Thank you for joining us for a San Diego ATD online event. My name is John Morley, and I would appreciate you adding your name in the chat window for a record of attendance. And if you'd like to network with the other participants, including your email address, would make that a whole lot easier. Okay, tonight we are fortunate to have with us Mr. Ken Phillips. Ken is founder and CEO of Phillips Associates. And he is the curator and chief architect of the Predictive Learning Analytics, a learning evaluation methodology based on over 30 years of experience designing learning instruments and assessments. He regularly speaks at ATD groups such as this, university classes, and corporate learning and development groups, including the ATD International Conference, speaking on measurement and evaluation of learning, and he will be at the annual ATD annual here in San Diego in May. Uh, Ken has held management positions in Count them, two colleges and two national corporations. Sounds as if he can't keep a job. <laughs> Shh, John, that's a secret. <laughs> Ken has written numerous magazine articles and has uh, been a contributing author to five books in the L&D field. His most recent book is a TD at Work publication entitled Evaluate Learning with Predictive Learning Analytics. And this is in addition to uh, several magazine articles he has written more recently than um, he, he put this out here. Now, uh, you will be seeing, of course, excellent speaker support. I would expect no less. And now uh, we can make this available to you afterward on request. Uh, Ken's going to send that to me. So with all that, Ken, it's all yours for the rest of the evening. Okay. Thank you, John. Okay. Everybody can see that? Yes? Yeah. Uh, yeah looks like add muscle to your post-training uh, evaluations. Is that what we're talking about tonight, John? <laughs> uh, see, see if you can make up something good for us. Okay, okay. So welcome, everybody, and uh, thanks for uh, joining us tonight, and uh, or this afternoon, I guess it's late afternoon in your case, it's at tonight here in Chicago, and it's also probably a lot nicer weather-wise in uh, San Diego than it is here in Chicago, so we have really cold uh, temperatures with a lot of wind. So the wind chill is down in the uh, probably low 20s. What I want to talk about today is uh, uh, about level one evaluations. And I want to start with a question here that I do, and I, you can just respond in the chat. So, um, you know, have you ever wondered if conducting a post-training uh, level one evaluations are worth the effort? And if you should just stop using them all together, is that a thought that any of you have ever had? So you can just type in the chat, yes or no. Yes, yes, okay, yes, yes, yeah, sometimes yes, okay, good. Yes, okay, sometimes, all right, all right. Okay, well, Kind of needed something, yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay. So we're uh, you're in the right spot then. So um, we're going to the uh, what we're going to do is uh, focus on uh, just for a second here the agenda. So you'll have some idea about what we're going to cover, and um, and just to reiterate, uh, I'm going to make because uh, you'll see there's going to be some math involved with this. Now it's not it's not um, math. It's math that. You probably learned in fourth grade, so it's not difficult math. Uh, but instead of trying to, you know, write down everything, um, I I told John, and he just mentioned it, that I'm going to send you the uh, the the slides. I'll send them to John, and he's going to send them out to all of you, so you can just spend your time listening and and understanding the math part of it. And then if when you get to actually implementing the math, you can just go to the slide deck and and uh, get the information you need. So uh, let's talk about the things we're going to focus on. Number one, I'm going to spend a few minutes just sharing with you some facts from a recent ATD research study um, that you can use to benchmark your organization's uh, use of level one evaluations. I'll say more about the, the research study when we get to it, if you're not familiar with it. Um, and uh, But uh, uh, that's the, the, the will be the value of the data here is that if you're looking to benchmark, 
um, what your organization is doing. Or if you're a consultant and you're working with clients uh, and you want to share this with them, uh, that would be uh, might be interesting for them as well. So the second thing is we're going to uh, I'm going to show you how to create predictive questions to include in your level one evaluation uh, that will enable you to forecast uh, these three things, level two participant learning. So you'll be able to forecast whether or not people learned anything um, in the uh, training session or not. You'll also be able to forecast whether or not uh, the people who attended the training are likely to uh, apply what they learned back on the job. So you'll be able to forecast level three uh, training transfer results. And the last one will be uh, if the uh, learners who attended your program do apply what they've learned on the back on the job, you'll be able to forecast uh, level uh, four improved business results. And um, so we're going to say more about the forecasts and what they mean and uh, and how to interpret those and so on in a second. Uh, and then the last uh, thing we're going to cover here will be to uh, I'm going to show you this is where, where the math comes in, uh, how to calculate three predictive metrics. And the the three metrics that I, I talk about are a learning gain score, um, a training transfer likelihood score, uh, and an improved business results likelihood score. So those are the, um, the three uh, predictive metrics that you will be able to create from these predictive questions that we'll uh, address first. So let me just take a second to quickly review this. I know most of you are probably familiar with the five level evaluation model, but in case you're not, I, I always just take a few seconds to just review it um, in case uh, you're not complete or, or you know you're not completely familiar with it. Uh, but the first four levels of this five level evaluation model, the level one reaction, um, the level two learning, the level three behavior, and the level four results, uh, that model, that four level evaluation model was first developed back in the late 1940s uh, by a guy uh, by the name of Raymond Katzel. And so he had published an article around this four level evaluation model. He's a training and development guy back in the late 40s. And in 1954, um, along came Don Kirkpatrick, and you're probably more familiar with the Kirkpatrick uh, four-level evaluation model. And so what Don did is Don was doing his PhD dissertation at the University of Wisconsin, and his dissertation was around evaluating uh, supervisory and management uh, training programs, because he was involved uh, at the, with the University of Wisconsin in delivering uh, management and supervisory training through their uh, for, through one of their uh, departments and it was continuing ed or or something like that and 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 while he was doing that he was also working on his on getting his PhD um, so he incorporated this model in his dissertation and used it uh, as a model to uh, to evaluate the effectiveness of this uh, supervisory and management training that he was doing. And so that was in 1954. And then in 1959, um, ATD, or back then it was ASTD, heard about Don's dissertation and the research that he had done. And so uh, someone from uh, uh, ASTD or ATD contacted Don and said, hey, Don, would you write an article for our monthly trade magazine uh, about the four-level evaluation model? And Don said, well, I can do you one better than that. What I'll do is I'll write you four articles, uh, one on level one reaction and one on level two learning and one on level three behavior and one on level four results. Uh, and so in 1959, at the end of 1959, and then uh, the first two months of uh, 1960, they uh, ATD published in the uh, trade magazine uh, these articles that Don had written about these four levels of evaluation. And um, so it was after the after Don had written these articles that this whole four level evaluation model became very, very popular because people then were aware of it and knew about it and you know saw the value in it and and saw how 
you know, it seemed to make sense logically in terms of, you know, measuring participant reaction to the training first. And then after that, you know, measuring whether or not people learned anything in the training. And then after that, measuring whether or not they actually applied what they learned. And then after that, measuring whether or not um, if they did apply what they learned, whether or not it improved uh, any business results. Um, and so um, it, it became the most popular evaluation model in the world um, after Don wrote these four articles. And then in uh, 19, about 25 years later, along came uh, a guy by the name of Jack Phillips, same last name, but no relation uh, as far as either of us know. And he said the four level evaluation model is, you know, makes sense. It's spot on. It works. Uh, um, you know, it's logical. And he said, but it's missing one thing. Um, and that is uh, ROI. And he distinguishes, Jack distinguishes the ROI or level five ROI from level four business results. And uh, so what Jack does is said, well, okay, you got to measure business results, but then you got to convert those business results into money. And that's when you get into the ROI. So he added on uh, the level five ROI. So that's the uh, that's the current model. This is the most popular evaluation model in the world, and uh, and that's why where we're going to focus today is going to be here on level one and the, the degree to which participants find a training favorable, engaging, and relevant to their jobs. So that's where we're going next. So let me share these facts with you from that ATD research study. This was done in 2019. Actually, ATD has done three of these. Uh, the first one was done in 2009. The second one was done in 2015. Uh, and this is the most recent one uh, in 2019. And the value in the three studies is that they asked essentially the same questions. So you, if you got all three studies, you can actually compare you know, what's happened uh, over that 10-year period from 2009 to 2019. Uh, and I'm just sharing with you these level one evaluation facts here, just three of them. Um, and the study itself will cover all five levels of evaluation, has a lot more information in it. So if you're uh, interested in, um, in finding out, uh, you know, what's happening out, out, happening out there in the world of measurement and evaluation, um, these, are, uh, these are three research studies that will provide you some great insight into that and comparative data over that 10-year period. Um, some other background information. Uh, there were over, around 100 different organizations that participated in this research. And that was true of all the studies. And um, they made a concerted attempt uh, in all three research studies to, to uh, uh, collect data from a broad cross-section of organizations of different size. So they had organizations as small as you know, 150 employees up to you know, tens of thousands of employees. They also made a concerted effort to um, make sure that it the uh, data wasn't dominated by a particular uh, you know industry. So uh, they they made a they made a concerted effort to include um, you know manufacturing organizations and service organizations and um, financial organizations and so a broad cross section of organizations from different industries, uh, which again adds to the credibility of the results. But uh, here's three facts that just to share with you. First thing uh, is uh, that what they found was uh, in this two, 2019 research, uh, this 2019 study, 83% um, of the organizations that participated in this research evaluate some programs at level one. So um, four out of five, a little more than four out of five of the organizations that were in the research did level one evaluations with some learning programs. Um, and those organizations that did use level ones with some learning programs, on average, they evaluated just a little more than half or 54% of all the programs they offer at level one. So four out of five organizations evaluate some programs at level one, and those organizations that use level ones uh, evaluate about half of all their training programs. The other interesting fact was this one is that only one out of three uh, of those organizations that evaluate some programs at level one felt like the data that they collected from their level one evaluation 
uh, evaluations had either high or very high value. So um, you can see a big disconnect between the percent of organizations that are using level ones and the value of the data that they collect from their level ones, which is why I asked you that question in the beginning to see, uh, you know, if you'd ever, you know, run into the situation where you were frustrated with the with the data you were collecting and uh, were thinking about, um, you know, possibly not even doing it because you just weren't getting any value from, you know, the effort. So let's talk a little bit about the disconnect. Um, you know, why the big disconnect between four out of five doing it, but only and then not only one out of three of those organizations feeling feeling like they collected any valuable data. I think there's uh, four main reasons uh, that I've identified. Uh, one is, uh, in most cases, level one evaluation data is not viewed as valuable. Uh, this is particularly true with business executives. Uh, they could care less about whether people like the donuts or, you know, they, uh, you know, whether they thought the instructor was, uh, you know, uh, humorous or whatever it might be. Um, and so that might be useful data for us as L&D people. And when we're thinking about what we need to do to, to, to deliver a program, but most of the business executives could care less about it. Uh, second reason is that level one evaluation data in most organizations, not all, but is oftentimes not systematically analyzed for trends and patterns, um, nor used to make program comparisons. So Typically, what happens if an organization uh, collects level one evaluation data, someone who is responsible for that training program probably looks through the results and, you know, nods and said, oh, yeah, that's kind of interesting stuff. But there isn't any systematic analysis that's ever performed where if you've got an ongoing program, you know, collecting data and comparing one of the programs with with a, a different iteration of that program with a different iteration to see what's happening across, you know, the trend to see if there's any changes um, and to see or to look for patterns where there maybe are particular areas that are scoring lower. Um, but that's typically not done in most cases. Somebody just kind of glances at it and, and almost never uh, comparing uh, one program with another program to see whether or not, um, you know, there's any significant difference between uh, what's happening with one program versus another. So the third reason is a few um, L&D leaders uh, have a specific objective in mind for collecting level one evaluation data. They know about the five level evaluation model and they know about level one evaluations. And so they just do it but they don't necessarily have a specific objective in mind for collecting that data and uh, thinking about what they're going to do with it after they collect it and how it should be analyzed and, and, and all those things. Um, and lastly, uh, there's a lot of L&D L &D professionals who just really lack the knowledge and skills needed to create uh, valid survey items. And, um, you know, just because you've taken surveys doesn't mean you know how to write uh, good survey items. And um, so, uh, and, and, you know, and when you've, if you've taken a, uh, you know, if you've gotten some professional training in, uh, uh, or of course, taking professional courses in learning and development, you probably had, you know, some introduction to measurement and evaluation and maybe a little bit around survey design and stuff. But uh, probably if it was you know, no more than one course, you know, so it isn't very in depth. And, and so there's a lot of L and D people who, you know, have familiarity with it, uh, but aren't really skilled at um, knowing how to do these things. So what's the solution? Uh, that's the reason we're here tonight. So we're going to include predictive questions on your level one evaluation. So that's the, uh, that will be our solution. So let's talk a little bit about what, uh, about what are predictive questions. So um, it's important to uh, have the right perspective on these. So they've, uh, they basically forecast the result, uh, the results a learning program is likely to achieve. And it's important to understand these predictions aren't proof that specific program outcomes are inevitable, but rather a forecast certain results are likely to occur. I, I My analogy that I like to use with it, it's like a weather forecast. You know, when you watch the weather person um, on the news and they talk about various models, you know, they'd say, well, we've got the European model and we looked at this model and we looked at this model and we've taken all that data 
And what we do is then we're able to come up with a forecast that we think is likely for San Diego or Chicago or whatever it might be. And, um, you know, and they're not always right, as we can all attest. We've you know, <laughs> had weather court forecasts when the weather was very different from what was forecasted. But the important thing is they're, they're, they're right often enough that the uh, weather reports are seen as credible. And that's what we're trying to achieve here. So we're not we're not suggesting that this is going to be scientific proof that you can share with um, you know your learning and development colleagues or business results, but these but these are predictions based on data, not just personal opinion or you know gut feeling or whatever. So we're combining the idea of uh, using data to make uh, predictions. And um, it, like the weather, like the weather uh, person does. Uh, the other thing is the data collected um, begins to answer the question business executives and those of us in L and D both want answered, and that is: Is this pro program delivering value? That's really what we want to know, and and certainly that's what the business executives want to know. If I'm sending my employees to your training program, I want to know if it's really delivering the value. Um, that you said it would um, when you know you you designed and 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 delivered it. So there's three types of predictive metrics that we're going to focus on. Uh, we're going to do the level two learning gain score. I'm going to show you how to do that. Show you the questions that you can use and put in, put in your level ones uh, to collect the data. I'm going to show you how to do the math to come up with this uh, this level two learning gain score. And then we're going to uh, focus on level three training transfer likelihood score, give you the questions, show you the math. And then the last one we're going to focus on will be a level four improved business results likelihood score. Do the same thing, show you the questions, and then and then show you how to do the math. So as I said, you'll get the slides. You don't have to uh, try to copy down all the math stuff, uh, but you just need uh, try to get familiar with it just so when you come back and look at the slides that... Um, you know, you'll you'll remember things that we talked about, and it'll be uh, easy to to figure out how to do the math. So let's look at predictive metric number one. This is calculating a level two learning gain score, and so here uh, we're going to ask two uh, parallel learning based survey questions. I'm going to give you the questions again, but you don't have to write them down because you'll get the uh, you'll get the slides and you can see it there. But here they are. So these are the two questions. Uh, the first one is um, on, on your, and again, put this on your level one evaluation. How much did you know about the material taught in this program before attending? And then the second question right after that is how much do you know about the material taught in this program after attending? So, um, and then you see there's the scale is uh, no knowledge uh, through thorough knowledge and um, and I use a, a seven point scale. We can talk a little bit more about that later if you want to, about why a seven and not a five. Uh, the other thing I want to point out about this, uh, these questions is if you want to, if you want to customize them, you can, you can say, how much did you know about the material taught in the conflict resolution program or the collaborative selling skills or, you know, whatever it might be. So you can customize these items and make it very specific to that particular training program um, if you want to. So uh, you've got some flexibility here in how you use these. So let's talk about first the steps in calculating a learning gain score, and then I'll show you the math. Um, so you wanna begin by computing an average before score. That was that first question. Um, and then you wanna ca calculate an average after score. That was the second question. And then you're gonna subtract the before score from the after score. And the difference is a learning gain score. So it's pretty simple stuff. And here's the math. I'll walk you through that. So these are the participants over here. So we had 10 participants. Um, and I'm, and then this is question one. How much did you know before? And so then you'll see the responses here. And what we're going to do is total up that uh, the responses for that first question. And this is the second question. How much did you know about the material 
uh, after this, after attending the program. And so we total up the responses to that question. And you'll see that one comes out to 59. And now we've got to, going to do calculation number one. So knowledge before attending was 44. We divide by the number of participants, which was 10. And then we come up with an average pre-program knowledge level, okay, a 4.4. Okay, so we take question one, add them all up, all the responses up, divide by the number of participants you had, and then come up with an average pre-program knowledge level. And now we're going to do the same thing for calculation two. So we've added all up, added all, uh, all the scores to question two, came out at 59. We're going to divide by that same 10 participants. Um, and now we're going to come up with an average post-program knowledge level score of 5.9. Okay, so now we've got one more calculation to do. And now we're going to take that average post-program knowledge level of 5.9, subtract the pre-program knowledge level, and that will give us um, a learning gain score. Now, with this particular predictive metric, um, it's important to understand that at this point, when you're, this is the first time you've done this with a uh, with a particular training program, the that learning gain score has um, I, I don't want to say no meaning. It has it has a lot less meaning than after you've done this with um, you know several iterations of the program. Uh, so the, to make that learning gain score meaningful, um, what you need to do is compare it to either a standard. In other words, you say, well, okay, we've got this training program and we want to achieve a, uh, you know, a learning gain score of, you know, whatever the number is, certain number. And so now we can compare the actual with the standard. Um, or if you've used this uh, process and, and, and with um, a number of, of the, of the tra of, uh, training programs, you can then create a norm and compare that learning gain score with the norm. Because right now, when you first do this, and the business executive might say, well, so is that 1.5 good or not good? And you can say only, well, it's better than 1.4, but it's not as good as 1.6. And that's about all you can say when you just have that first data, first set of data. So that's where comparing it to a standard or to a norm makes it much, much more meaningful. Okay, any questions on the learning gain score? I, I, I guess, John, they can unmute themselves. Can they? Um, can you let them do that? I believe people can. I see Kevin is unmuted. I'll himself. start. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, Kevin, I've what's got your a question? couple, but I'll, I'll let other people jump in. Um, definitely want to hear more about the seven point and the five point. I love kind of debating stuff like that. But, uh, I'm wondering how you control for maybe like the participant experience level. I guess what I mean by that is we have a lot of programs that are kind of designed for, say, entry level managers, but then sometimes they get used for a director level. And so obviously that could skew if that's the right statistics term, right? You've got people that are much more experienced taking the class. Now you're, oh, I knew this factor kind of comes down. Anything you could say about kind of in controlling for the audience level or what's the right way to say that scientifically are they mixed kevin or do they tend to be in their uh peer groups let, let's say they were separate you know let's say you were delivering this class over and over you got fairly high numbers because it was all entry level managers and then whoop you offered it to directors and now all of a sudden they're like nah. yeah i would because the groups i mean a great observation and a great question i i would separate keep the group separated because yeah. the 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 experience level is likely to uh, influence how they're going to respond to those uh, two items, like how much they knew before. Probably if they've got a lot of experience, they're more likely to know a lot more about the topic than people who are entry level uh, and new to the, you know, and new to that particular mm -hmm. job. So uh, I, I, if you convolute, if you, if you pull them all together, summarize them all together, I think you end up um, you know, you could, you'll get answers and data, but I think it might be a bit misleading. And so I would, I would separate them out. I guess what, what I'm hearing you say, maybe it's not a statistics question. The question is, why are you offering the same class to the director? Maybe that's the better question. Well, there might be a good, I mean, you know, I, there might be a good reason. 
So, uh, yeah, I mean, you could, yeah, you you might ask that question too. But I think if if the decision is, yeah, you know, you're, you got, you know, everybody's going to go through this thing regardless of what level you're at, then uh, it probably is worth looking at and separating out the data just to see if there's any difference. I can anticipate a concern about this is all self-reported and can we really trust people to uh, legitimately determine how much they know beforehand and how much they have actually learned in the training? Uh, it, would it be, have you considered actually doing tests, a, a pre-test and a post-test? Would that be more accurate than what we're seeing here? Well, we're... we're um... Yeah, you can do that. Um, I'm and uh, so there. There, self-report data is yeah. That's an issue. Um, I think uh, you know that um, there. You need to before before people complete the survey, you need to do a little sell job on on you know getting honest responses and that nobody's individual response is going to be I you know singled out and it'll just be group data that's going to be shared and looked at. Um, and, you know, I think that can help uh, to, uh, to minimize the, the, uh, the potential bias, like somebody not saying, well, I didn't know anything about this beforehand. Uh, although they get, I mean, the other thing about the two questions is they get a chance to say, well, now I know a lot more about this. So they're not necessarily going to look bad. And I think that's the issue with the self-report data. It's always like, well, if you ask a question where somebody needs to, you know, is going to end when their response is going to end up making them look bad, then, um, then you, you know, that there you then you there's more potential for um, biased responses. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Oh, you want me to address the, let me just take a second to address the, because we're going to see the other questions are going to have the seven point scale. Let me just address the five point versus the seven point scale. So um, five point scales are, are perfectly appropriate if you've done nothing to influence the way people are going to respond to the survey item. So if you're creating a you know, an employee satisfaction survey, and you've done nothing in your organization to influence uh, employee satisfaction, or you're doing customer satisfaction survey, and you've done nothing to influence that, a five-point um, scale is perfectly appropriate because you're as likely to get responses on the low end as you are on the high end. The problem with when we get into training is that we've designed and delivered uh, what we think is the very, very best training program possible. And so assuming we were successful, what happens is if you use a five-point scale, it becomes a, a three or possibly even a two-point scale because you don't get any ones, twos, maybe no, and in some cases no threes, and all your answers and all your responses are four and five. So all your responses tend to cluster at the high end. And so in order to get a little more granular data, if you go to a seven point scale, you add one more point on the high end to spread the scores a bit. So you can get more granular uh, data with a, a seven point scale when you've done something to influence the way people are gonna respond. And I recommend people consider, um, I, I recommend three, one is a seven point scale, another is a nine point scale, another is 11 point scale. All of those add more data points at the high end so you can spread the scores. Some people push back and say, oh, people are never going to answer an 11-point scale. And I say, okay, well, then use a nine-point scale or use a seven-point scale. So it'll it'll help di to distribute your responses a little broader, and you'll get a little more granular data. Uh, why not even numbers so you force people to either be for or against so yeah, the, the problem with that is, and again, what will happen or what can happen is if the vast majority of the people respond on the low end of the, of the even scale, it makes whatever you're measuring look worse than what it really is. And if the preponderance of people respond on the high end, it makes whatever you're measuring look better than what it really is. So it's, it's, uh, you get better data if you use an odd scale 
uh, when you, and, and so you have a, a mathematical midpoint, which is a response option. Now, if you're doing marketing stuff and you're, you know, doing marketing surveys and you were trying to figure out which, which uh, marketing campaign is going to be the, you know, the most effective one, um, you could, you, I think you could make a legitimate argument that maybe using an even scale there because you're forcing people to either the high side or the low side probably has some validity in that case, but that's not training and development. That's marketing. And we're trying to get the most accurate data possible. Okay, Are we any other questions or we'll rock on here? Yeah, hi there. I just had a question on the last two companies I worked with, they're technology companies, so maybe that's the reason. But instead of doing like a level one, they focused on the net promoter score. And that's when they, when they did a level one survey, they used that. Is that just a different a different way of doing a level one, or can you talk a little bit about kind of the pros and cons maybe of that, or maybe that's- yeah, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, uh, thanks for bringing that up, Joe. Sure. I'm, I'm a, a proponent of a strong proponent of using the net promoter score methodology. Uh, what happens is I think a lot of people um, when they use that net promoter score, they, they interpret the data to um, to uh, assess the the um, effectiveness of the training, right. and um, so what you want to do is to make sure that when you because you're familiar with the math, right? Because you know the net, net promoter score math. You take here, you compress the the high end, and those are the promoters. You get to compress the low end of the scale. Those are your demoters. And then the middle of the, the middle folks in the middle are passives. They're not even counted. And so when you use the net promoter score methodology, you're subtracting the number of or the percent of detractors from the percent of promoters. And I think it's a measure in training and development. I think it's a legitimate measure of program quality, because the question you're asking is, you know, how likely would you be to recommend this program to, you know, your work colleagues or work friends or whatever. And it's a measure of program quality. It's not a measure of program effectiveness. And I think that's where people carry it too far. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. You're welcome. Any others? Ken, there's a there's a guy named Kenneth Nowak. He was writing about this in TD Magazine. I don't know if that name's familiar. He recommended you measure it three points. Not only post program do you ask about you know what did you know before, what did you know after, but pre program you ask what do you know before, with the idea that when you ask post program, there's all sorts of bias that creeps in, right? People just sat there maybe for five hours in the class, and so they want to justify. Hey, I was here for five hours. Yeah, I think I learned a whole lot more. Um, what do you think about measuring of those three different points? You know, having a pre-program measurement in addition to capturing both post-program. Yeah, that's a. Uh, it depends on uh, not <laughs> a good question, Kevin. It depends on on the kinds of questions that are asked. You know, if you're asking questions around program content that specific stuff that's going to be taught in the training program, um, you know, it's unlikely if you did a pre-assessment uh, pre that people are going to know uh, much about any of those topics, you know, because it's kind of jargon stuff. You know, you're going to know about the, you know, the, the four boxes or the, you know, you're going to know about the net promoter score methodology or you're going to know about this. So it tends to be jargon stuff. And I think uh, that's just a waste of time because, the items, um, you know, if, if assuming people are responding honestly, uh, the, you know, you're going to come up with low scores on virtually all those things because it's stuff that they're not going to be familiar with because they haven't had the training yet. And so it's kind of like you're saying, well, we know, you know, we, we knew that these we're just we're we're we're. Uh, providing data or showing data that says people didn't know anything about these things. Well, duh. Yeah, that's no big surprise. Um, so that's where I struggle with it. You know, I think there's a, a legitimate use for pre-survey kinds of things, but I see a lot of misuse of those. So 
I don't know. That's kind of a long answer to your question. That's a good answer. Okay. Can I just add also my company, We I just got pushed to kind of move from the level one to doing a, like pre-knowledge check and a post-knowledge check because it just sounds more meaningful. And unless you really are skilled at designing questions, I mean, I find over and over again that what I think was a good question and has, you know, multiple choice answers, people like interpret it differently. And then I'm like, I don't know if this is about my training or it's about the question itself or it's really hard. Yeah. Yep. No, I think a good observation, Heidi, I think, uh, uh, you know, it was like my comment earlier about writing survey uh, items. It's same thing with writing test questions. Just because you've taken tests doesn't mean you know how to write good test questions. And you really do need to, I mean, there's there, there, there's some science behind that. But in addition to that, you also need to collect some data on your questions um, from a pool of people who are going to be either your learners eventually uh, or are similar to your learners so that you can look at the results and see uh, two things. One is what percent of the people answer the question correctly. So there's some guidelines if you have, uh, and generally the guidelines are if you, uh, between uh, 30 and 70%. So if you have a question that fewer than 30% of the people uh, answer correctly, it's it's not a good question because it's either too hard or confusing um, or it's just completely irrelevant to you know their, their background. Um, and if it's higher than 70%, then that says, oops, maybe this question is too easy because it's not really doing a good job of discriminating uh, among people who really know this and people who don't. And then the same thing with doing your multiple choice question is looking at analysis as, of the response option. How many people you know, choose each one of the response options? And you don't need a lot of data to do that. You know, If you had 25 or 30 responses from people um, you know, a pool of people of either your learners who are going to attend the program eventually or from, um, uh, you know, a, a similar group of people, you can do the analysis and and uh, come up with much, much better uh, uh, scientifically sound test questions. Because if you have some response options that are overselected or underselected, that's a problem. Um, if you have response options that aren't selected, that's a problem. And so, um, you know, especially when you're talking about a pretest, because you would expect to see, you know, some kind of normal distribution across your response options. Um, and if you have some that that aren't working, that's not a good thing. So if you had four response options, you know, and two of them were not being selected at all, you don't have four response options. You got two. It's like a true false test. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right. We ready to move on? Okay. Well, we got a bunch of stuff out of the way that we won't have to deal with with the rest of these. So, because uh, it's the same, it'll be the same scale. So, we'll save a little bit of time. So, now we're going to go to predictive metric number two. Um, and so, this is calculating a level three training transfer likelihood score. So, we're trying to forecast. Uh, based on the data that we collect at the end of that level, at the end of that uh, training program, whether or not the learners are likely to go back and apply this uh, back on the job. So the uh, we're going to ask five uh, training transfer survey questions. And um, I'm going to show you the questions and then we'll uh, do the math and show you the math. So let's... Uh, Say a quick word about the um, uh, about the uh, first four questions here. Um, so these first four questions that I'm going to show you here, uh, there are multiple research studies uh, that have found that these uh, four survey questions uh, are positively correlated with training transfers. So these are not things that I just dreamed up one night while drinking a glass of wine or having a beer. Um, there's some there's some science behind um, these four questions. And, uh, and that's why I selected them, because they all correlate positively 
with uh, training transfer. So that's an important thing to keep in mind about these. So here's question number one of the five. So we're gonna ask a relevance question. So how relevant was this program to you and the tasks and requirements of your job or of your work? You can, you can customize that a little bit if you want to. I would try to stay within the framework of the question as much as possible because I, when I uh, pick these questions out, I pick them out of the, out of the research and this is the way they were asked, but um, you can, you know, modify that a little bit if you want to. And so we got not at all relevant, extremely relevant, seven point scale again. So here's question two of five. So this is a confidence question. So how confident are you in your ability to apply the new information you learned in this program back on the job? And not at all confident, too extremely confident. Here's question three. This is opportunity to apply. How likely are you to have an immediate opportunity to apply the new information you learned in this program? And again, you can put the name of the program in there instead of just referring to it a program generically. Uh, back on the job. Um, and so, as we all know, uh, the longer the time lag between somebody attending the training and then having an opportunity to apply it, the less likely they are to ever apply it. So uh, that, that's why this one is um, critical in terms of, of uh, training transfer. And so it's uh, one of those questions that correlates positively with training transfer. Um, and then the, the fifth, uh, fourth one is um, manager support. So how likely is your manager uh, to actively engage you in a discussion regarding your use of the new, new information you learned in this program. Um, and, uh, and again, we all know in the same scale, uh, seven point scale, not at all likely, extremely likely. And But we all know, again, managers play a critical role um, in, you know, after somebody attends uh, training, plays a critical role in whether or not uh, that person they sent to the training is actually going to apply it back on the job. And they're, um, you know, what they do or don't do after the learner comes back from the training program is uh, going to uh, have a big if, um, impact on training transfer. So those are the four questions out of the five. And then the, the okay. fifth one. Uh, can, can, uh, uh, could you uh, get this wrapped up in about five minutes then? Oh, yeah. Okay. okay I got to hurry. Yep. Okay. So here's question five. Uh, and that is, um, what obstacles, of any, might keep you from applying what you learned in this program back on the job? So you've got those first four, and then you're going to ask this one. So let me run through the calculating, and then I'll show you the math. Um, and then we are uh, we just have that last one to do, but there's only a couple of questions. Uh, so you want to compute a uh, total score for each of the first four training transfer predictive questions. Sum the four total scores together and divide the result by the number of program participants. And then next divide by the resulting number, and, and then next divide that resulting number by four. And the result is a training transfer likelihood score. So let me just show you the math. So here are our same 10 participants. Here's question one and two and three and four. And then you'll see the totals down there at the bottom. So we got 49, 53, 44, and 44. So those were the responses that we got for those uh, for each one of those four questions. Um, and that's the totals. And then what we're going to do is use these calculations. So we got relevancy total, confidence total, opportunity to apply total, manager training support total. So we add all those together. And then calculation number two is we take the training transfer total, the predictive question total, divide by the number of participants, which was 10, divide by number of survey items, which is four. And so that gives us a training transfer likelihood score of 4.8. And then this is the way you can help interpret that score. So a score of six or greater indicates that training transfer is likely to be high. A score between three and six uh, indicates that training transfer is at risk. So, and we'll talk about what you do about that here in a second. And a score of two or less indicates that training transfer is likely to be low. So if you have a score that's less than six, um, what do you want to do? So uh, that's where we're going to talk about when we uh, identified that question five and all those obstacles um, that we came up with there that the learners identified that they thought would uh, prevent them from 
uh, or inhibit them from applying what they learned in the training back on the job. So identifying obstacles to training transfer is only half your job. And so making sense out of them is the other half. So I'm going to give you a, a, a method for doing that. Um, and this can apply to any qualitative data that you collect that you're trying to analyze and, and, and turn into quantitative uh, data. But um, what you want to do is to, in this case, analyze the obstacles for themes and patterns. So you start looking at all the things that people have indicated, and you will begin to see um, patterns that will emerge or, uh, you know, or themes that will emerge from the obstacles that are mentioned. Then you want to consolidate all your like-minded obstacles into clusters. Count the number of obstacles in each cluster and then place the clusters into numeric order from highest to lowest. So it'll look like this. This is some actual data uh, from a, a client that I worked with, and they were implementing a, uh, a uh, resiliency training program. Um, and so these numbers here represent the number of times um, that obstacles were mentioned that we categorized that had to do with management. So the, the bold uh, uh, items that you see there, those are the categories that we created. And, you know, that's, you just use common sense and good judgment for that. And then we counted the number of uh, obstacles that were listed in each one of these, and that fell into each one of these categories. And now you can then take a look at this and you can say, okay, if we want to uh, impact training transfer, because we've got the training transfer likelihood score that was at risk or low, these are the three areas uh, where we need to focus our efforts initially. Because yeah, I, I can, uh, uh, please excuse me. I, I just uh, check in the uh, uh, calendar, and this does, in fact, go until 7 o'clock. So I, I was wrong, and you have uh, much more time here to... Uh, Can I talk slower, John? <laughs> talk slower? <laughs> no, uh, you have a uh, you use as much time as you need here. You have okay. an additional 30 minutes to make us smarter, and we appreciate okay. you doing that. Thank you, John. Sorry for my mistake. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, so so now you have some 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 uh data that you can use to focus on and say, okay, if we are going to try to increase training transfer with this particular program. These are the things in the areas we need to focus on first. Um, and so, um, you know, we, you, and I, what I did is listed some examples here of the obstacles that were, that had, were written down by, by the learners. Uh, and I did that more for, if I'm going to share this data with a business executive. So when you say, well, management's an obstacle, they're going to know, well, what do you mean by that? And so I just give them some examples or policies and procedures are an obstacle. And so you give them some examples. That's why I've included those. Um, but now you've got some information where you can say, OK, let's let's sit down and talk about this. And particularly with this one, um, you will no note here that, you know, management and policies and procedures are not things that L&D has control over. And so you're going to have to partner with that business executive or they're going to have to partner with you in order to increase training transfer and gain maximum value from, you know, having their uh, employees attend that training program. So it's a way to be able to set, set up a situation where you can partner together to try to figure out what we need to do uh, to uh, either mitigate or eliminate um, you know, these obstacles in order to increase training transfer. So training transfer likelihood score question. So we can unmute yourself. If you've got questions about the any either the four questions or the five questions when we asked about obstacles or the math. Ken, I was just noticing, I mean, I think this is great and be really useful. And I also know that in my organization. Unfortunately, a lot of the reasons I'm doing any kind of evaluation is just to prove that I should exist yeah. and not necessarily make things better. So I am trying to push back against that, but that's, yeah. that's kind of the reality. I just have numbers to say, oh, people are learning really. Yep. You, should, you should keep, you know, keep me on board. <laughs> Well, and I think the, um, I mean, I think you're headed in the right direction, Heidi, because I, because, you know, with most business executives, uh, data 
speaks very loudly. So if you got data and it's not personal opinion and it's not just gut feelings, but you got data, they're much more likely um, and it, I'm much more likely to, to listen and be interested in talking about that than anecdotal stuff. So I think that's the value that this provides. It, it helps you, you know, it's not going to happen overnight, but it'll help you to be able to position yourself better as a strong business partner in all this stuff, as opposed to the training person over here that we may or may not need. A real strength I see in this is that it is fairly quick and easy. It's uh, self-reporting. It's uh, very quick surveys where a more comprehensive, a more level two sort of thing gets real expensive in terms of coming up with uh, questions and tests for people to do and observing people on the job. So I think this is a much more practical uh, approach, although actually training people rather than relying on self-reporting might be a more valid measure of the training. Right. Yeah. And uh, the, I would, um, one of the things that I rec strongly recommend is, you know, this is just the starting point. You know, you're doing these, these are forecasts. This isn't scientific proof. So you really still need to do uh, a level two knowledge test to, to you know, measure whether or not uh, people learned what was covered in the training and then correlate that with your learning gain score to see if they, you know, if they correlate with one another. And then when you get to level three, you really need, you do need to collect uh, level three uh, behavior or behavior change data. Um, to correlate that with your training transfer likelihood score to see whether, again, it correlates. And that's where you would get into um, possibly, you know, probably not just including um, learner data, but would collect data, especially at level three, from uh, other people that, 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 you know, have firsthand experience with that learner and would be able to provide credible evidence as to whether or not they're actually using these behaviors that were uh or what was you know, what was taught in the training program so yeah this is just really a first step mm -hmm. and, and uh, in your experience how likely is it for clients to take the next step to do a level two training oh to, to ca write test questions uh, yeah, well, uh, my, my own experience as an instructional designer is that I'm usually just under so much pressure to crank out more training, more tra more stuff, more yeah. products more, that uh, the client never takes. Uh, I mean, everybody does smile sheets, but uh, that's pretty much, uh, gee, I like the lunch. The air conditioning was too cold. I like the donuts. <laughs> oh, donuts are good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And tell jokes. Yeah, right. Uh, I had uh, I did a was doing some work with the Department of the Navy a number of years ago and I had uh, uh, and we were traveling around the world uh, delivering this uh, performance management training program and one of the people that I traveled with uh, was uh, a a musician, musician and so he would do magic tricks at the beginning <laughs> to uh, and during the, you know, breaks and doing stuff like that. And I, I, and people loved it. <laughs> I don't know that it aided learning, but he, they loved it. But yeah, I, I think that um, that's always an issue. Uh, and, and my experience has been that it really takes, if you're talking about inside a corporation, it takes somebody who has um, a, who is either dedicated or has a strong interest in, uh, doing the measurement and evaluation piece. Otherwise, it happens like what you described, John. You know, you you do the smile sheet. Somebody looks at them and say, oh, hey, this looks fine. Uh, and then they, you know, move on to the next project. Um, so it does take some, um, you know, uh, some effort to to do this. And and I would also say it, it, it's depend, it, it also requires some attention from the learning leader. They need to want it too. You know, because that that way, if they want it, they say, well, we got to do this, then people are more likely to do it. Um, so, yeah, it's a, that's an issue. I would agree. Anything else on the training transfer? So let's do the last one. 
Um, and then we, I'm, I'll hang around if there's, uh, if you want to uh, have uh, more questions and I'm happy to hang around with you. Uh, so here's predictive metric number three. So that's calculating a level four improved business results likelihood score. And we're going to ask two parallel business results survey questions uh, to be able to uh, calculate this metric. So I'm going to show you the questions. So this, the first question is, how likely are any of your department's crucial business metrics to improve because of you applying the information you learned in this program? Let me, let me before going to question two, let me talk a little bit about this one. If the training program was designed uh, and developed and implemented to address a specific business metric, either in the department or in the organization, put that in there. Instead of crucial business metric, put in the name of the business metric, reduce, you know, turnover or uh, increase, uh, you know, uh, customer satisfaction scores or whatever it is. So the more specific you can make it, particularly with this level four stuff, uh, the better the data you'll get. Because uh, when you talk about, you know, business metrics, I mean, they may, a number of things may occur to them and they may not make the connection between the training and a particular business metric. So if you can identify that, that'll get you better data. And then the second question you wanna ask is, how confident are you um, in your response to the previous question where zero equals no confidence and 100% equals high confidence? So those are the two questions. Um, and so we'll calculate uh, an improved business results score this way, multiply uh, each participant's response to question one by their confidence percent, uh, percentage from question two and divide the total by 100. I'll, I'll walk you through that so uh, you can see how that's done. It sounds more complicated than what it is. You want to add the adjusted responses and divide the total by the number of participants. And the result is an improved uh, business results likelihood score. So let's walk through the math. So still have our 10 participants. They're, they're hanging in there with us. Um, so this was question number one. So how likely, you know, is this particular business metric uh, to improve, um, you know, if you apply what you learned in this training program back on the job. So we got the responses from our 10 participants. And then we're gonna ask that second question, um, how confident are you that your response, uh, you know, to the previous question is accurate? So what we're accounting for here is error in uh, potential error in somebody's estimates. And so, and, but what we don't know is whether they overestimated or underestimated, but we want to account for that potential error because it'll give us more credible data. And so what we're going to do is take uh, the, the participant 011. Uh, and so they said uh, on a scale of one to seven, they said a, a two likely to improve business results. And I'm about 60% confident that that's accurate. So we multiply the 60 times the two, we get 120 and we divide that number by a hundred. And so that means our adjusted response, uh, because we're trying to take the most conservative number here, the most conservative uh, estimate. And so we now um, are gonna say the adjusted response is 1.2, it's not two, because we're accounting for that error, that's that 40% that, that error um, that uh, is uh, that participant 011 has at their confidence level. And so we do that for the second one. So you take the seven, multiply times 90, that's 630, divide by 100. And now our adjusted response is 6.3. So we're adjusting downward. And this one, um, I, we skipped the, the 013, but I wanted to show you this one. This one, zero, zero 004, they said, you know, uh, likely uh, improve business, likely improved business results are, are going to be a six. I rated it a six, and I'm 100% confident that's right. So if you multiply 100 times six, you get 600, divide by 100, you get six. So it's the same answer with when they're 100% confident. Um, so you're going to want to do that for all your um, responses here. And then you're going to total the adjusted responses, 
to 34.6. Uh, and now we're going to take the 34.6, divide by 10, the number of our participants, and our improved business results likelihood score is 3.5. And the same uh, guidelines apply here. A score of six or greater indicates that improved business results are highly likely. A score between three and six indicates that they're at risk. And a score of less than two indicates that uh, they're unlikely. Now, the other thing I would say here is don't use these two questions if there isn't any connection between the content in your training program and some kind of either department or organizational business metric. Otherwise, none of this stuff is going to make sense to people. So there's got to be a connection between the training program, the content in the program, and you know, some business metric that you're, that um, the, uh, you know, someone wants to, to uh, improve. And, uh, and if it's not there, then, um, you know, if you're like trying to teach people how to create spreadsheets in Excel, if there's not any, you know, any business metric that's being tracked that says, wow, we need to teach people how to do spreadsheets in Excel, uh, then don't ask this, uh, don't ask these uh uh, level four questions. You can do the learning gain, you can do the training transfer, but don't ask the uh, improved business results, only if it, there's a connection. So okay. Ken, I, I have a question on that, actually, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Um, so yeah, business results are often like two or three steps beyond the learner. Like they don't, the purpose of the program, for example, is to improve retention and, and like leaders in the program really don't know what retention is based, like they they wouldn't be able to gauge but we know let's say that the more frequently they do one to ones with their employees i'm just making this up the more frequently they do one to ones with their employees then retention will probably go up we think we there's we think there's a correlation between that so do you, are, are you saying, um, but so we, I guess we should, the question we should ask is how confident are you that this training will increase the prevalence of one-to-ones? Like, can, if you can't get business metrics, can you drop down into lower level metrics and then make and have the calculation still be meaningful in that way? Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question, Melanie. No one's ever asked me that before. So, <laughs> um, you're welcome. Yeah, <laughs> no, but I, I mean, I, I'm glad you asked it because I, I think, I mean, this is just off the top of my head. So I'm I, tomorrow if you contact me, I may change my mind. But, but I'm thinking that, you know, yeah. I mean, if drop down. I mean, you know, I mean, when you're talking to business executives. Um, they may they may also understand that. I mean, even if not the it's not the business metric, but it's the one of the things that's going to influence the business metric, and we can track that. Um, I you know that's that's dangerously close. So I would I would uh, I, I I think that's a great idea. I, off the top of my head, I would say go for it because it's going to well, be more meaningful for the learners because they would have more understanding of life, just like you pointed out. And I guess, uh, thank you for that. And I, I guess my secondary question to kind of dovetail off of that is my biggest challenge is really trying to articulate to the senior team, for example, how the program will impact retention. Because me, I mean, as Heidi put earlier, they don't really believe that it's going to impact, like they don't care. Like it's so how, do you have any advice for us in this journey of measurement and how to connect those measurements that we can get to those higher level metrics? Yeah, there. Um, I, I contact me offline and we'll uh, go through there. There is a method that, that uh, Jack Phillips, my namesake, has developed uh, called um, expert estimation where it where he uses that to isolate the effects of a of a training program so that you can better uh, then connect 
uh, any improvement in the business metric and, and, and connect it to uh, the training program and isolate the other things like uh, maybe they're, I don't know, they you know change the pay uh, schedule or the pay uh, or uh, time off or whatever it might be. There'll be other things that might have contributed to that. But this technique will enable you to isolate the effects of the training. And um, we, I'm happy to, to you know, take that offline with you and show you how to walk through the math. So I think it's doable. It's just, uh, you know, it, it's not part of this, but it's doable. Cool. Thanks. On that final question there, uh, is there any concern uh, that uh, the skepticism may go in one way rather than the other? I'm, I'm thinking about the uh, the first one where the first answer was two, uh, two out of seven, which is pretty pathetic. But his confidence in that is uh, only 60 percent. So he's pretty skeptical. Where is the skepticism? Is he skeptical that uh, it will even be up to two or is he skeptical that it will be that low and it could be just fabulous it could blow out the the, the, the seven on the top is there any way to really adjust for that or know what that skepticism is yeah yeah if there were low scores like that john the, the only way to really uh you know peel the onion and try to find out more about that would be to probably do a focus group, you know, if you had a several people or or do one-on-one -on -one interviews where you could say, okay, here's how you rated that first item. You rated it a two, but you were only 60% confident. You know, tell me why you rated it as a two and why were you only 60% confident in your response? What was getting in the way? But it would require some additional data gathering. But yeah, I mean, the beauty is you 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 know you know who the people are now, so you can go in there and you can cherry pick the ones that you want to do that with and uh, go after some um, you know more insightful data. In your experience, how likely is it for a company or a client to do that? Because not only have they lost the productivity being in training, now you want us to bring them into a focus group and ask them questions and such. Yeah, well. If they are, um, I guess my, my uh, <laughs> there's no good answer. If they, if they spent the money, they could, you know, to send somebody to the training, um, wouldn't they want to maximize the value of that investment? And these focus groups, you know, you could probably do that focus group uh, with five or six people and do it in 15 minutes or less, maybe 20 minutes. So do they have 20 minutes of spare time? You know, unless they're in a call center, probably, or maybe mm -hmm. even in a call center, they might be willing to pull out, you know, a few people um, for you to to put together in a group. So, yeah, I, I think it's it can be done if they want the data and they want to really uh, improve the, um, uh, you know, the, what's happening and improve the results of the training. Um, you know, they got to invest the time. Mm -hmm. And Ken, I, I would add too, a lot of times in surveys, oftentimes they're anonymous. So just having those open-ended questions, whether it's a short answer to, to get a better understanding, because again, sometimes people look at that scale and they just rate it. And it's very, very funny. Sometimes I get a, I get a kick out of when I see someone has scored something very low, but then their response is, this was a great training I learned, but they yeah. didn't really respond in when they did the one through five or the one. So I feel sometimes, and also when you're working with people that maybe um, aren't used to surveys, it could be different, um, you know, cultural differences, global. I've worked with a lot of global companies yeah. and unless they're very clear, like one to five and what one means versus five, I think that really has to be specific in the very beginning and some people might say but it's so obvious but it's not it really isn't yeah. and i see that there is some confusion so i always like to add when i'm doing surveys is add some of those is there anything else or what do you what did you like most about the session or what uh what feedback do you have for us to be more effective or maybe even uh, you could even do a multiple choice of 
this, what, what do you feel this training hit on the most? Maybe you're focusing on core values. So here are company for va core values, which one resonated, which one do you see the most connection with like the topic and our four core values and let them pick maybe it's one or all of the above. What do you think about doing that? So you get a little bit of a, a little bit more information and you can kind of determine themes versus just this, you're hoping someone interpreted the question the, the right way. Yeah, I, I would say that um, there were two things that I wanted to point out, that the, 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 these predictive questions um, are not the only questions that you may want to include on the level one evaluation. So there are other things that you may want to ask about that will help and supplement the data that you are able to uh, collect here with these predictive questions. Um, I, so, so yeah, yeah, keep that in mind that there are other questions right. that are possible that are that you could include on your, you know, and should include. I mean, you may want to know whether people like the donuts or not, and so I'm, <laughs> I, you know, ask that question if that's if that's important. Yeah, so that might help a little bit. In, in resolving that, but but certainly your uh, explanation uh, explanations in the beginning or, or, or explaining the survey and how it's going to be used and who's going to see the data and and all of that is uh, goes a long way to getting um, more uh, credible and valid responses as well. All right. Thanks, Ken. Does that help at all, Jill? Yes, it does. I just wanted to just make sure because I know we're focusing on certain things and. Again, I didn't want to assume that it was just those questions because I'm thinking right. that's just two questions. Typically, it's five, seven. And I know there's also a limit of how many questions you want to ask. Yep. And you get into the factor. A lot of times we build in the last five minutes of any session for them to do the post-survey because everyone's rushing off to another meeting. And although yep. they say, yeah, I'll do it, and you send them the email, you've just lost people. So if we have that captive audience, we always say, yep. great, do the, do the survey now. And we feel like we, um, in, in my experience, I feel like I get a higher percentage rate of completions for the survey. If I do that as well yep. and yep. let them know ahead of time, you know, the yep. purpose of it. Yep. Yeah. No, you're spot on. Yeah. I mean, once they leave that, then, uh, what becomes a problem of tracking people down who don't respond and that right. requires a lot more time. So, yeah. Okay. Let me just get through the rest of this. So here's a quick poll question. So what's your reaction to the, uh, add your, add muscle to your level one, uh, post-training evaluation of predictive questions. What do you, you can type in the chat, either a nifty B interesting C thought provoking or not sure D. C, thought-provoking, Kevin. Okay, good. A and B, okay. A and C, all right. C, okay. I like this quote. Uh, so um, if we have data, let's look at the data. If all we have are opinions, let's just go with fine. That is from Jim Blankenship, who was the former CEO of Netscape. Um, and uh, I like this because uh, when you're talking to business executives, they may not be saying this to you, but they're probably thinking it if you don't have data. That's where we started talking at the beginning about having data as a way to position you as a business partner uh, and not go in there with um, anecdotal information um, or gut feelings or opinions and all of that kind of stuff. So uh, that's where this comes into play. Uh, some other resources for you here. There's a bunch of uh, articles that I've written on all the different uh, levels of evaluation. And they're on my website, uh, which is, uh, I think John put that in the chat and it's also down at the bottom of the slide. There are three articles that I've written on uh, level one evaluations. The, the middle one there, predictions and probabilities and training evaluation, that's the content in this, in this, uh, in this uh, session. So that article is another source for reviewing what we covered in here, because I go over all the, uh, all the things that we went through here. And then uh, the other two have some other things that uh, talk about level ones. Uh, there's a couple of eBooks on my website as well. This first one, uh, The Sad State of M&E, I mentioned at the very beginning when we did the, uh, the data from the ATD research study, 
I've summarized all three of those research studies in here, not everything, but I created this ebook um, and it's on my website. And if you want to look at, you know, what's happened over the that 10 year period from 2009 to 2015 to 2019 and look at what's happened with the different uh, levels of evaluation, uh, that uh, ebook will summarize all that for you. And I can just give you a heads up here. Nothing has changed in 10 years. <laughs> uh, the other uh, ebook that's down there is uh, this whole predictive learning analytics methodology that uh, was in that John mentioned in my bio. Um, that's a, uh, an overview of the uh, predictive learning analytics methodology and um, reviews that and, and you're able to capture data uh, using this methodology at the end of a training program to predict um, which people are most likely to apply what they've learned, which are at risk, which are least likely, which managers are most likely to support the training, which managers are least likely. And all of that, there's five metrics that you're able to come up with um, and identify that will then pinpoint the underlying causes of what's called scrap learning. That's training that's delivered but not applied. Um, and so you can take targeted corrective action. So that's what that ebook's about. Um, I'm doing a, uh, a training program for uh, Training Magazine. This is Training Alive and Online. On starts on uh, June 6th, and it covers all four levels of evaluation. So uh, it'll go into level ones, level twos, level threes, level fours. Also, how to um, make sense out of the data that you've collected. And um, so if you're interested in that, you can sign up for that, um, that uh, program. Um, later this year, I'm going to offer um, I, my predictive learning analytics certification program, and it'll cover that whole predictive learning analytics methodology and walk you through how to do it all and so on. And that's my contact information. So you can, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to connect with you if you want to connect. And you will be right here in uh, San Diego in May before your June thing. I will be. And if you're going to be at the conference coming, uh, I'll be presenting on level three evaluations made simple, credible, and actionable. And um, come and say hello or come and stay for the whole thing. So thank you very much, uh, Ken. We appreciate everything. Are, are there any other questions? And I was I was hoping you could say a little bit more about maybe sharing this with executives, right? No question this stuff is interesting, but I need a little bit more to make it kind of useful. And I, I guess what I mean by that is, you know, even if I go to somebody and say the participant satisfaction was 4.7 out of 5, that might be fluff in a way, but at least it's in immediately understandable, right? There's some, oh, yeah, I get that, right? If I go to my executive and I go, our, our training transfer score was 4.8, uh, you know, I, I need a little bit of how do you create the context and the storytelling around that? You talked a little bit up front with the first metric around you got to have norms, but can you help us understand how do you either set some context around these things or how do you deal with the common pushback that you get? in order to not just come up with really interesting metrics, but to go, okay, now how do I present this? Yeah, um, I, there's, I think there's, um, uh, you know, an education process, Kevin, that needs to go on to educate the, the business executives around the kind of data you're collecting and, mm -hmm. and the value of it uh, before you get into the numbers. Um, and I would, uh, I find that uh, it's um, important to ask the business executive how they want to, uh, receive the data, see the data. Do they want it done, you, uh, you know, like a PowerPoint presentation? Do they just want a report to look at first um, or just have a conversation, you know, just kind of sitting down and we'll talk about it. Um, so I try to find out what's their preferred method or mode of, of uh, you know, having this con data conversation or conversation around data. And then I think there's then once you figure that out, then the next part would be the education process in terms of. So let me give you a little context about, you know, why we collected this stuff, because people are going to be interested in training transfer. I mean, when you explain it to them, because, they, you know, if I sent my people there and they're not applying it, that was just a waste of time. And so I think you can get their attention by, uh, you know, doing that uh, explanation and then then sharing the data. So here's what we found. And here are the things like with the training transfer question, here are the obstacles. So we need to talk about these because if we're going to increase 
the training transfer for this program, we need to address these obstacles here. So, I mean, you've got a, a nice logical path that you can lay out there for them. Um, you know, and, and, and I think when you start to do that, uh, the word will spread and, you know, that one, one executive will talk to another executive and they'll say, hey, you know, Kevin came in here and showed me some really interesting stuff. Um, and, uh, so I think it, it will get easier over time, but it, it can be a challenge in the beginning for sure. Okay. Uh, Ken very generously offered to uh, get the copies of his uh, slides to me. And uh, if I have your, if you are a chapter member, I probably have your email address and I will send this to you. Otherwise uh, you can see uh, my email address in the chat window, John at ID for hire uh, dot biz. So, if if the chapter doesn't have your email address and you want a copy of the slides, please shoot me an email and I will be happy to send that to you. So any other questions? I really uh, appreciated that, Ken, because I can get <laughs> so overwhelmed and frankly kind of cynical about this stuff and you made it seem actually doable. <laughs> Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thank marketing, you, <laughs> mar mar marketing's the hard part. Getting this so <laughs> to uh, to uh, management, it it really is. And I I I think that this is just amazing to us that the amount of money that goes into training and it seems to be the least measured, the least analyzed output of uh, anything done. I, I think uh, never ceases to amaze me that in uh, training and education, the only areas of life where people will put down their good money and say, give me the least that you possibly can. <laughs> well, I find it's also about like, even when, I do the evaluation and, and one time I even like videotaped to, you know, see if people had skills and then no one looked at everything I came up with. And, you know, <laughs> our HR business partners were like, oh, I'm too busy. So it was like, why bother? Yeah, yeah. Pe people are busy. I, I go back to the Jim Blankenship quote, you know, <laughs> if you don't have data, there's it exists. probably not going to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as I think has been uh, uh, accepted knowledge, the less somebody knows about something, the more they think they know about it. So uh, people yeah. who don't have our background in uh, training and development think that, uh, well, they uh, that they made a video. That should work. Uh, what's yeah. the problem? <laughs> This is really helpful. Thank you so much, Ken. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of your evening. Ken, I think you said you're in Chicago, so it's pretty late for you. I'm just in California, so. I am i haven't had dinner yet, so that's what I'm going to go oh on. My God. <laughs> It'll be a late dinner. That's dinner and a glass of wine and then go to bed. That sounds good. <laughs> that's, right. that's right. Well, I got nice a few more emails everyone. to answer here after I have dinner, so. Okay. Oh, Sounds good. Ready. Thank you so much. It was very informative. Appreciate okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Come and see me if you're going to be at the conference in May, uh, the international conference. I'll be there. So Look forward to it. Yeah. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye, everyone. Thank you all for attending. Much appreciated. Thanks, John. Well, thank, thank you. Ken. Bye.